Good morning, Arcola. Hope everybody's doing well. I am uh, actually down at the beach this morning, but you're uh, getting to see me anyway, so that's kind of cool. Um, I just wanted to uh, catch up with everybody and just say I hope you're having a great start to your summer. We are excited. Next Sunday night, we are going to hopefully uh, be at a pavilion and meeting together, having a praise time and sharing. So I hope to see you all there. We'll ha hopefully you've heard something about that this week. Let me just pray for Mark as he comes to speak, as he begins this new series that he's starting today. Father God, it's uh, with such a joy to come and uh, just fellowship with our believers. I, I am so excited about getting back together soon, where we can physically be in one place together. Father, I pray that you will guide us as we move forward as a church. Father, we, uh, we thank you for the message you put on Mark's heart today. I pray that you'll speak through him. Father, as we take a fresh look at Jesus, uh, just use these messages that throughout the summer to just draw us closer to you. We do pray for some in our body that are uh, facing different challenges. There's some with medical challenges. We lift them up. We pray for uh, Leo that he is uh, out traveling out to Alaska. Be with him. And be with our body, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, I am really excited about starting this new series that we're launching into over the summer. We're calling it Encountering Jesus. And, you know, I find in church circles that we can know a lot about Jesus, but we don't know him all that well. A lot of Christians can even share some of the prophecies that all point to Jesus' birth, we can talk about some of the theology, about the cross and the resurrection, and that's all good. But then there's this, you know, 30-year gap or so that the life of Jesus, the man, that we're not quite as strong on. And I think it's really important that we know Jesus well. Something I heard that's really got my attention is one of the reasons Christians struggle with praying is we feel like we're talking to a stranger. And that can't be the case. So my prayer is that as we go through this series, through the Gospels, where we're going to be talking about the life of Jesus and encounters he had with people, that you will fall more in love with him, that you will get to know him better, and follow him more closely. So, where does it all begin? We're going to be using, for the most part, the Gospel of Mark. You can open your Bibles there to Mark chapter 1. That's where we'll be basing from today. But I want you to see that the gospel is much more than just a personal ticket to heaven. It's part of a much bigger story than just your individual decision. You see, the king himself summons you to follow him. He'll tell you your ultimate destination, but he's not going to tell you the road you'll travel. But he'll give you everything you need to complete the journey. Mark's Gospel starts this way, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of the Son of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Talk about an entrance that just jumps right in there. You see, Mark's Gospel, many authors, uh, scholars believe, was really Peter's Gospel. Mark was a young protege of Peter who walked very closely with Jesus. Mark's Gospel was written primarily for a Roman audience. It's very staccato, and it goes from event to event to event. And if you read through Mark's Gospel, which I encourage you to do this summer, it's only 16 chapters, read through it, and you, you'll get tired just reading it because you think, did Jesus ever sleep? Just boom, 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 from one thing to another. It's action-packed. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Gospel. What is that really all about? The word in the Greek for gospel is euangelion, which means really good and important news. In ancient usages, euangelion was a proclamation impacting the empire. A couple instances, they found old government documents from the Roman Empire which used the word euangelion, and this is what people would have understood behind it. One of them 
was when there was a proclamation declaring that the Emperor Augustus' birthday was going to be how the calendar was marked. Because that was, quote, such good tidings for the people of the empire. Good tidings is the word that we use for gospel. When Vespasian became the emperor, that was declared to be gospel, good news. So when we're talking about Evangelion and these announcements, it is good news, but it also it is also much more than good news. It is about a proclamation that's good and that's going to impact many. It means more than just, hey, good news, we're ordering Subway for the church luncheon today. So, God has been at work throughout Old Testament history to reclaim his kingdom that has been marred as a result of the fall. In Mark chapter 1, the promised Savior, the Christ, is now in place. And the satanic forces are doing everything they can to thwart the plan for God to reclaim the kingdom and make it new again. And they actually got to the herald of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist. At this point, he is thrown into prison, and he is later on going to be beheaded. The action picks up in verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. The proclamation is that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. We would state it today, the time is now, the kingdom is here, it's in our midst already. You know, the kingdom of God was Jesus' most talked about topic. His teaching ministry started with it right here in Mark chapter 1. And then he was teaching on it. Some of the last things he taught his disciples at the beginning of Acts, the kingdom of God. The book of Acts starts with the kingdom of God in chapter 1, verse 3. And it ends with the kingdom of God in chapter 28, verse 31. Yet we don't talk about the kingdom of God enough. But the kingdom of God is really what the gospel is all about. So how does this all fit together? What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is quite simply God reigns over his universe. That's the kingdom of God. But you say, wait a minute, there's still sin in the world. I still see that it's not all right. It's not put back together. It's not in place. That's right. The kingdom of God is already, but not yet here. Now, I know that sounds a little contradictory. So how do you tie all that together? Think about day. Dawn is day. It's still kind of dark, but the light is just beginning to creep over the horizon. And the day gets brighter and brighter and brighter all the way to the noonday sun. In the same way, God's plan to reclaim his kingdom, it's already begun. And the kingdom is partially here. And Jesus coming to earth was a major campaign in God's battle to regain the kingdom. And one day it will be finished. And during that time, there's going to be a lot of darkness in the world. There will still be sin. There will still, still be tragedy. But the king is keeping things going so more people can come to him for salvation. So the kingdom of God is already, but it's not yet. It's here, but it's not here in its full and complete form. So how does this relate with the gospel? What does this even have to do with the gospel? The fact is, God reigns, and he is establishing or reestablishing his kingdom. And he offers citizenship in his kingdom to all who will believe. 
In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says that when you believe, you get citizenship in the kingdom of his, God's, beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. That's how you become a citizen of God's kingdom. The summons. So there's a proclamation. The kingdom is here. The summons, the invitation, is this. Repent and believe in the gospel. See, the gospel is much bigger than just you or just me. God reigns. He is king. And he is reclaiming his kingdom that has been marred by sin. He offers citizenship in his kingdom to all who repent and believe in the gospel uh, who believe in Christ and his work. So how are we supposed to respond to all of this? Repent and believe. What is this really all about? Repent is a change of mind. Now it's a change of mind, but it does affect the whole person. Don't split things apart like an exploded diagram and say you've got the mind over here, the heart over here, the body over here, because where your mind goes, your body is going to go. Here's an experiment I don't want you to ever try. But if you were on a bike in an empty parking lot and there's a lamp, a light pole in the middle of it, you can say, I'm not going to hit the light pole, I'm not going to hit the light pole, I'm not going to hit the light pole, and I guarantee you, boom, you're going to hit that light pole. Where your mind goes, your heart follows. Where your mind goes, your body goes. So it is a change of mind for sure. It starts in the mind, but it brings the rest of the person with it. Repentance, it's a change of mind and attitude towards yourself and towards God. It's a recognition of, I am a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a savior. You see, true repentance starts with the mind, but it grabs the whole person. True repentance starts with the mind, but is not divorced from the rest of the person. Secondly, I'd say true repentance is not a work. It's not something you have to womp up. It's something that is granted by God. In Acts chapter 11, verse 18, really exciting times for the early days of the church. The, uh, the apostle Peter had just been taken way out of his comfort zone because he was very comfortable around people with his Jewish background and God had said, I want you to go to a Roman soldier, Cornelius, and share with his household the good news of Jesus Christ and invite them into the family. And Peter at first was like, I can't do this. Read the account, Acts chapter 10, chapter 11, both of those chapters. And then in chapter 11, Peter retells it to the Christians in Jerusalem. And the Christians in Jerusalem hear what God has done with this Roman soldier who was public enemy number one to the people of Israel at the time. But this guy and his household en masse received the good news and placed their faith in Jesus. And Peter's telling the Christians all about this. And then in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, it says, when they heard these things, they, self, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So repentance is not a work. Repentance is a change of attitude, and it paves the way for belief. No repentance, no belief. Because if you don't repent, then it means you haven't recognized your sinfulness and you don't see your need for a Savior. So repentance precedes belief. After repentance comes belief. What is belief in all of this? Belief is much more than mental assent. Again, it starts with mental assent, but it quickly goes to embrace the idea of trusting. It's something that you say, I believe this to be true, and I'm trusting in it. We are to trust. You see, repentance and belief are distinct things yet they are inextricably bound together. 
And it's very interesting, as you read the New Testament in the Gospels and in Acts, you will see the Gospel presented differently in different times. In some cases, the Gospel will appear to be just believe. In other cases, it will be repent and believe. Well, well why is that? Is that a different message? No, it's the same thing. But, in some cases, the person needs to be told, hey, you got to repent if you want to be ready to believe. In other cases, it appears the people had already repented. You know, I think in John chapter 3 of Nicodemus, a high up in the Pharisees, the guys who were publicly opposing Jesus, it says in John chapter 3, verse 2, that uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And he said, look, we see that there is something special going on here. No one can say and do the things that you're doing if God isn't in it. And Jesus talked to him about entering the kingdom and having eternal life. And he kind of tied those things together. And he only mentioned belief. Well, I would say that Nicodemus already had a repentant heart. Because all the other Pharisees were publicly challenging Jesus, trying to score points with the crowds. But Nicodemus wouldn't like that. He said, I know God is doing something through you, and I don't fully understand it yet, but I want to find out more. That's a repentant heart. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. You know, the Bible uses more formal language than we do when we speak. And the Philippian jailer answers, asks this question, of Paul and his buddies, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And when you just rip that sentence out of the Bible and read it like that, it almost sounds like they're sitting across a table at an ancient Starbucks from one another, and the jailer is asking a philosophical question, saying, uh, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? But when you look at the context, that wasn't the case at all. He was a gibbering, suicidal heap on the floor. He was going to kill himself. And he said, guys, what do I have to do to be saved? I'm done. I'll do whatever. He, he would have believed anything. And Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. He'd already done the repenting. Repentance and belief are distinct, yet they're inextricably bound together. Repentance comes before belief. And in some cases, there might be a gap in time between when there's a repentance and when everything kind of clicks into place and then belief. And in other cases, it may be almost simultaneous. People are going to express repentance differently. Some people, like the Philippian jailer, are going to fall on their faces weeping, saying, I desperately need help. And for others, it's going to be the calm assurance that I am a sinner. And Jesus is a Savior greater than my sin. God knows the heart. We're saved by grace through faith. But apart from repentance, there is not saving faith. So how do these tie together? Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that I enjoy sitting outside in my backyard reading. But the problem is, when it rains... That interferes with my reading time. But I can build a little pavilion, and I'll stay dry, and I can read outdoors and get the best of all worlds there. So when I put this pavilion up, the roof keeps the rain off my head. But there's more to the roof than just the roof. The roof has to be on posts in the ground that hold it up. So it would be true if I said, you know, this pavilion is keeping the rain off my head. It's also true if I say, boy, that roof is keeping the rain off my head. But the reality is, if it wasn't for the posts, the roof would not be able to save me. It would not save me from the rain. You have to put the posts in the ground to hold up the roof. Likewise, repentance comes before belief but you are saved by belief alone. So the roof keeps the rain off your head, but for the roof to get up there, 
It's got to have the posts holding it. The kingdom of God is at hand. God's redeeming work is kicking into high gear, and he offers citizenship to all who believe. The gospel is about much more than a ticket to heaven when you die. You know, Jesus is never recorded in any of the gospels walking up to anyone saying, hey, uh, would you like to know for sure that you can go to heaven when you die? He doesn't present the gospel that way. His message was much bigger and much better, and we need to reclaim that today. He invited people to join his kingdom, his work, to start eternal life here and now. Eternal life is not something we delay and wait for. Eternal life starts now. The instant you believe, you are transferred into his kingdom. You get citizenship in heaven. And God expects us to be an agent of heaven while we're here on earth. What does this look like? In verse 16, Jesus is passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. See, these disciples were invited, I would go as far as say commanded, to come and follow Jesus. They didn't know everything that would be involved because I don't think they could have handled it. But Jesus would steadily reveal it to them over the three years he was going to spend with them which will culminate with the cross, the resurrection, and the, and the ascension. But can you imagine Simon Peter minding his own business, literally, tending his nets, and this rabbi, this religious teacher, says, come, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Can you imagine if Jesus told him, hey, Peter, come, follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And by the way, I'm just telling you, in about 25 years, you're going to hang upside down on a cross and give your life for me. I don't think Peter would have handled it. None of us know the future that God has for us here on planet Earth. But we do know that we have a king who will walk with us every step of the way and give us everything that we need to do the job he's called us to do. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John didn't know all that entailed. But Jesus said, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They followed him. They didn't ask all the questions. They just followed him. And what you're going to see as we go through this summer, uh, this series in the summer, that these guys bungled it up badly more than once. And I find that encouraging because I'm doing that. And Jesus is so gracious and so kind in leading them along the way. He won't call us to do what is impossible because he will give us everything that we need. You see, the king wants you to trust him. When he says, follow me. You know, these are uncertain times. We've got covid We've got racial unrest in our country. We don't know what the future holds, but God does. And our King will never leave us or forsake us. Our King wants you to trust him for everyday life as well as the everlasting life you're gonna be enjoying later on. You see, Jesus invites you to join him now. The ball is in your court. You must decide to follow him. He won't make that decision for you. Jesus invites you to follow him. And as you repent and believe and turn towards him, he will transform you. He will do a work in you. And as you follow him and get closer and closer to him, he's going to rub off on you. And so you start thinking like him and speaking like him and acting like him. And it's not all religious works. 
It flows out of a relationship with the king that he wants us to have. You see, following him is not adding works to the gospel. Following him is the overflow of belief. If you truly believe that Jesus Christ is God and died for me, it's going to do something to you. And the normal, natural response is, I'm with him. Jesus Christ, King Jesus, gives us everything we need for the journey ahead. I'm really looking forward to us encountering him this summer. My prayer is that we will get to know him better, love him more, and follow him more closely. And as we do this, we'll look back and we'll say, whoa, this is wonderful. I'm thinking more like him, I'm speaking more like him, and I'm acting more like him. And it's not something I tried to womp up. It's not something I took a course in. But just as we walk with him, he rubs off on us. So let's make this an adventure, a journey together as a church where we encounter Jesus, walk closely with him, and serve together as agents of his kingdom right here in Northern Virginia. Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you. Lord, I thank you that you have done everything that needed to be done so that we could be made right with you. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who follow Jesus wholeheartedly. I pray that we would obey his command to follow him. And Lord, I pray that you would give us stories of you doing things in us and through us that are greater than we can ask or imagine. And I pray this in the matchless name of our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mark, that was an exciting beginning to this new series. I, I'm excited that we're going to be jumping into this. And Can you give us a little insight? What are, what are some of the things we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks? Thanks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, this. Uh, coming up next week is we're going to go back. We're look at Jesus' childhood. We call it growing up well. Uh, there's a section where Jesus interacts with the uh, priests in the temple. Uh, we'll talk about that and how do you grow up well. So there'll be application in this for children, for youth, and for parents as well. Then after that, uh, the third week, we're going to talk about how do you face temptation. And I'm really looking forward to this one. I've got my great friend Blake Dumay is going to be uh, preaching that one for us. He'll be a guest preacher, so you won't want to miss that. That's going to be Sunday uh, July 12th, and then we're going to carry on through the life of Jesus after that. What do you think of the first uh, message, Mark? Well, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued a little bit because I'm looking forward to uh, the whole concept of just walking with Jesus day by day. It's kind of a little bit intriguing mm -hmm. to me because it, um, you know, it smacks of having someone alongside you, kind of helping out. Um, in, sort of in a really integrated way as opposed to sort of um, just sort of like an academic thing. So I, I was, I, I'm particularly looking forward to how some of these actual encounters go down and how they can be applied. That's always my thing, you know, how, can, how it can be applied um, to us. And can you give us maybe a little foretaste already of maybe some ways you see how that sure. practically as we sort of just go about, um, you know, going to work, coming home, or going to the basement, coming home. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, practically how this how this is going to work out, you think? Well, I think, you know, for one thing, for example, is we all face temptation in life. Temptation will hit us in different things. There are all kinds of ways to sin. We, we're pretty much experts at discovering ways to sin. But how do, you, how do you stare down temptation and beat it in everyday life? Well, we'll be talking about that when Jesus was tempted uh, by the devil. We're also going to talk about times where Jesus demonstrates that he is greater than different things around us. Jesus is greater than the law. So how do you live this Christian life without it being a bunch of rules and regulations? Uh, we'll, we'll approach that. Um, so all of this is Jesus alongside us. It's a relationship which is the key. It's a conscious awareness of Jesus no matter where I am. That I think really is the key we need to work In my with. car. In your car. At McDonald's. That's right. He is there. Mark, what about the current issues that we're facing? A lot of people are dealing with a lot of fear. 
Yeah. You got a lot of fear because there's so much unknown. You got yeah. the COVID, you got the unrest and you know riots and a lot of that kind of stuff. Are we going to hit something one of these weeks? We're, you think we're, gonna we're going to that? hit some of these because we're going to see that Jesus is Lord over a number of different things. And they're all things that are kind of fears we as human beings have at the core of our being. Jesus is Lord over the, the evil spirits. He is Lord over the law. Uh, he is Lord over disease. He is Lord over uh, nature around us. And when we see that I'm not in control, but... I am walking with the one who is Lord over everything, then that should give us some peace. So what does that practically look like? We'll learn from the disciples who, as I said earlier, they messed up. They didn't trust him all the time, just like me. So I think it's going to be real practical for all of us. Well, I hope you'll join us over the next few weeks in this summer. I know this mark over here is excited. This mark, we got the two yeah, marks. I'm excited. And I'm excited too, so we hope to see you this summer. The three marks. Three marks. And the gospel of yes, There you go. Marks. <laughs> yeah. We've got a trifecta, so it's going to be good. So join us this summer, and I hope to see you soon.